Um, yes. Tell me what's up. I'm with you. I mean, like when we take into things like, like Brene Brown. Yes. We talk, we talk about shame. You know, like most people, let's just say just violent people in general, people who perpetuate violence. Often at the root of that is, is shame, is like these kind of things that are being perpetuated. Mm -hmm. So a lot of white people have white shame and that's why they can't work through that. Like, like let's take example, some white people I know who for them to be loved by their father, they have to be a high achiever. So then if I say to them, you did not achieve every single thing. You didn't achieve anything you had without white privilege helping you. Like for them to own that subconsciously, they have to then recognize that, my father's going to love me less because I didn't achieve this by my own bootstraps, all of these kind of things. So then how do you, how do you disentangle that? Like, that's not real love anyways. It's your father's own baggage. There's nothing to do with you. Most people aren't putting in that kind of an emotional work anyways, that's going to allow them to free themselves up to start to take personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so that's not something that you can get people to have an aha moment in while attacking them. That said, and I know I'm going on a tangent, that said, people who are in power that are perpetuating these kind of, you know, racist ideologies, sexist ideologies, I do think that those people should have their power taken away. I don't think that if you have power, you have influence, that the public spotlight is a place for you to have these transformative aha moments. You need to, you need, your power needs to be taken away, and then you can have your your transformation, your therapy, all those kind of things. If you're a transformed transform person and are no longer perpetuating violence, then that you're a different person. I'm not going to hold you to who you were in the past. Mm -hmm. But if, you're, if, if your actions perpetuate violence and systemic oppression, then I am, an, I am an, of the belief that, that leadership is not yours. That, you, that, you know, like, I'm not going to touchy-feely work through it with you while you're at the same time using your leadership to hurt other people. Yeah, I hear you. And um, my only, I think, caveat or maybe modification to that would be that I just don't think anybody should do that, you know, and I don't think anybody should utilize their influence to affect that kind of negative um, a uh, wave of action, so to speak. I don't think anyone should do that. Mm. I mean, definitely we don't want the leaders doing that, but for sure, I, I just, I see so many people doing that on so many different levels that I'm like, let's just go ahead and cut all of that out altogether because mm. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, okay. So I want to circle back to something because something that you mentioned, I was like, okay, I get what he's saying, but what about, so you were talking about like, white supremacy, or well, not white supremacy, but white privilege and how, you know, if someone feels that they are not worthy of like love or attention or acknowledgement because they haven't achieved, then, you know, that's the way it is. Like their dad's not going to care about them if they haven't achieved a bunch of stuff. So what I'm wondering is what if in that scenario, instead of the father being like, okay, you didn't actually achieve this stuff on your own, like by pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, you achieved it because of your white privilege. What about the cases when you've got fathers who are like, no, I expect you to use your white privilege. If you're not using it, then there's a problem with you and I'm going to disown you for it. Like, what about the, cause I feel like those are scenarios that are happening that are like, it's all tough to break out of, but I think those are really, really tough to break out of because I've met some people who were living in that. Mm. Have you encountered that before? We're, I don't, I haven't heard any fathers you or like white people using that kind of language. Most people to me who are using that kind of language don't really believe white privilege exists. Mm. They believe that, whiteness itself is better is best is the most important okay so, so keep going sorry but i i hear what you're saying so i think it's more the almost regular things that white we as white men are are taught that it's just the the regular narrative 
is that, you know, it's, it's yours for the taking, you go for it. And I think white privilege deployed also looks like, you know, like, well, I'll just make a donation or I'll just talk to the judge or I know that police officer or it's, or boys will be boys or, you know, like those kind of things I think are the ways that white men to white men communicate like our white, like whiteness is okay. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But, but that was the clarifier. Well, I, I lost your question though. Like what, what about for people in situations like that? Well, yeah. Cause you were talking like we've, I feel like we've been going back and forth on this whole idea of privilege. And, you know, once you are conscientious of what your priv privilege holds and, you know, how it kind of makes things easier for you, how you can sort of take some actions to make sure that you're stepping either stepping outside of that or making sure that other people get to have access to the same opportunities so that, you know, you can kind of balance the playing field a little bit. But I think that there are a lot of people, what I was saying to you when I asked my question is I think there's a lot of people that actually get indoctrinated into the idea that, no, we have this privilege and we're going to use it. Mm. We love it. And we're going to use it to the fullest and this is good for us, you know? And I mean, again, I, I'd like to think that I wouldn't be so ruthless, but at the same time, I can't promise that I wouldn't be if I had access to that kind of power or, or opportunity. Um, and I'm just saying that as, as somebody who's trying to be an honest human, uh, after living as a black woman, of course, I, I feel differently about that. But if I was just placed into a situation where I had privilege right off the bat, I would probably want to live it up and just be happy. Um, you know, and that's, that's kind of the point is that like, you don't want to be inconvenienced or you, it, what I saw a quote that said something about like your degree to which the degree to which you don't want to be made uncomfortable. That is your privilege. Mm. I hear footsteps again. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. Yes. Hi, what's up? It's later, mom. Okay. Yeah, it is later. Oh my God. You said later. <laughs> <laughs> and it's later. We did exactly what you said. Oh, he's gone. Okay. He's he's my independent one. Like he'll he's he'll just come and tell me what he's doing. And I'm uh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> she, she waits for him. Once he does it, then she's in, huh? Yeah, it's can you like tell their personalities like just based on what you're seeing right here? Cause she's like the really boisterous one and he's like the chillax one. I was actually surprised when it was him, when he opened the door. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Parenthood. That's fun. I, you know, on, on what you're saying that we, I, I don't know all your, I well, like our, for example, um, and you can tell me if you don't want to answer do you do you identify as Christian? No. Do you identify as like Jewish or Muslim or Sikh? No. So so then you more or less have some form of like within the religion category privilege. But I don't see you like if you see a Muslim woman being like, let's get her. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Um <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, I, I would say that as far as my beliefs are concerned, they probably would align closer to Christian than they would to um, Islam or Judaism, like probably more, more Christian. But as far as like practice and stuff, like, no, I don't really do that. I'm not in the practice of, I haven't attended church in a very long time. But I'm I'm just pointing out that like, and I'm sure if we went through like more personal ones, we were say like sexual orientation or income status or mm -hmm. are you a U.S. citizen? Like mm -hmm. that there are areas that we would highlight that's like okay in this area you do have privilege. Are you when you go for a job or are voting or trying to market something, being like using that to your advantage by putting down someone else or? you know, when, or when you hear someone say something Islamophobic or against people who are homeless, do you, do you speak up? I, 
from what I can tell, you're probably the kind of person who, who says something. <laughs> oh, it, is that what you think? <laughs> I, where'd, where'd you get that impression from Tom? I don't know how you would have ever come to that conclusion <laughs> uh, you know what's funny is um, I don't know you, you told me that you were like kind of getting into punk rock around the time that you were in college and so I was kind of trying to guess like what time frame that was but I was a senior in high school when 9-11 happened. Mm. And I remember very clearly thinking to myself, and I think I had a teacher at the time who might have said it too. I remember thinking like, this is going to be like, Muslim people are going to experience the same kind of discrimination that black people have been experiencing. Mm. I remember having that thought in my head and wondering like, oh gosh, you know, how is this all going to play out? And sure enough, like, in the years after that, there was just more and more propaganda, more and more jokes being made here and there about like, you know, people with turbans on their heads and whatnot and terrorism and things like that. But, you know, that's like seriously become a thing. And I've always felt like, uh, I know what it feels like to be pushed out or made fun of or marginalized mm. or, you know, told that you were different or othered. And so I've never, ever been cool with that whenever I experience it. Now, granted, I don't go, I don't want to make it seem like I'm somebody who like puts on a cape and goes out of her way to, you know, stick up for Muslim rights. I believe Muslim people should have the same rights as anybody else. That's what I feel. But I know that there have been a couple of instances at the airport, incidentally, um, where I've been like, you know, that's, it's not okay for you to treat that person like that. Mm. Because I think in instinctively, I just kind of knew I was like, oh, Muslim people are going to face a really rough time. All Middle Eastern people are going to face a really mm. rough time in the United States right now. Like no one's making the distinction between, um, you know, Arab people and Persian people and no, nobody's making the distinction there. They're just classifying everybody in the same little lump sum. So mm. So yeah, you were right to assume that I was somebody who would speak up because I have been and I try to be um, <laughs> as much as I can. I try to use my voice as instrumentally as possible. I mean, I have a voice that just vocally, it's very loud and it can get people's attention. But what I've realized is that getting people's attention isn't the only thing. You have to have something meaningful to deliver once you get their attention. Mm. And so maybe spend some time being quiet until you figure out something meaningful to say. Mm. I, what, what I was hearing you say is th that like you will never have the ability to in areas of your life where you do have privilege I will never be able to use that privilege with the power of a white man like I'll still be using that power that privilege as a black woman yeah I mean that's all I know I can't step into the shoes of a white guy I you know I I can try I can empathize as much as possible um, but ultimately, yeah, no, my experience is always going to come from the lens of being a black woman. Which is why I think, and this isn't my, I'm not the one who's saying this. This is, you know, like Angela Davis and, you know, really awesome feminist writers. That's why at the forefront of most revolutions or most activism, the vanguard is always black women. Because when you think of like, white the white wave of feminism was we want to eliminate sexism so that we can be as powerful as white men it mm -hmm. wasn't we want to end all forms of discrimination whereas black feminism was that because like there's there's no way that either way like we have to end it all and so and i think it's because of like what you're talking about like when 9 11 happened for me i didn't know what muslims were I didn't mm -hmm. think, oh, they're going to start to be discriminated against because I had no reference point for what discrimination felt like. I'd never been, I'd been bullied. I'd been, you know, biased as an individual, but not as an individual, just because I was a part of a group of people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. 
<laughs> so were you in high school when 9-11 happened? I was. I was a freshman. Okay, yes. So, um, yeah, you were a few years behind me. But um, I would really love to get up to New York and visit that memorial because um, mm. my English teacher, so my senior year in high school, my English teacher, she was actually pregnant, but she had a cousin who was on the flo or Florida the New York fire department. Um, he worked for one of the stations out there and he ended up going missing after nine 11 wow. and they never, yeah, they never found him. Oh my God. So she took off to go to his memorial service during our senior year. It was really eventful because she went to that and then she came back and she must have only been there for like maybe two more months because I remember right before we went out for Christmas, she brought her newborn baby back. And we got to meet him and we had a different teacher for the remainder of the year. But mm. anyway, all that aside, um, yeah, so it just, 9-11 affected me in such a crazy, like, I say it's crazy because I wasn't there. I'm not from New York. I've never, other than, you know, passing through New York to get to Niagara Falls or stopping there briefly on a layover, I've not spent any time in New York. So mm. I'm not somebody who... Um, I don't have like a serious personal connection. And so I always think it's kind of funny when I talk about how much I, I, how much 9-11 impacted me, but I feel like mm. it did. I feel like it really changed my senior year of high school a lot. Mm. <sighs> okay. My, my daisies are looking so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> my are. piece of paper is coming together as well. I wish I had a black marker. Let me see if there's one in my box. Okay. Okay, so we're almost out of time, and I'm thinking that there's probably more questions that I should ask you. So, we well, wanted to talk about Adora. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Since you volunteered, let's hear about your wife. <laughs> what do you want to know? Okay, so how did you meet her? We met on OkCupid, which is a dating app. Yes, I've heard of OkCupid before. So, um, messaged her. We, we, oh, I messaged her and said, um, I, I, so I found on OkCupid, if you actually said something like that was other than, hey, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> or like a copy and paste, if you actually acknowledged the person was a human being and, you know, that you actually wanted to, go on a date with them because it's them, not because they're just a body. Then, mm -hmm. you know, but anyways, all that to say, I, I said that, you know, like, hey, you seem really cool. I'd like to meet up. I do recognize that, uh, though I'm outside of the age range of what you're looking to date, but, you know, I, I still suggest you, you give me a shot. Yeah. So then she replied and was like, well, I also see I'm outside of your age range. So I was like, oh, I didn't know that. So then I went and changed it right away, changed the age range was like, never mind, we're good. So she's like, okay, <laughs> fine, let me give this a shot. So LA traffic, long story short, she wouldn't give me her, her phone number or her, her real name. So there's no way I could get a hold of her. And I didn't know that you, there was an OkCupid app. This was before I was all into technology. Okay. So I was driving and it was taking me an hour and a half to get to where we were meeting because of traffic and I had no way to tell her. And then I got there and valet was full. So complications on complications I ended up being 15 minutes late so when I got there she was gone after 10 minutes she was like screw this guy I'm out of here <laughs> she's like bye <laughs> <laughs> so that was our first day 15 minutes late you you're done I'm out of here so I I logged on to a computer and was like I'm so sorry you know my apologies you know just took ownership of it and was like, give me one more chance. So this was maybe like May 10th. And she told me. May um, 10th? Seriously? It was like the beginning of May. That's my birthday though, May 10th. So really? I think it's funny that you pulled that date wow. out of thin air because that's like one of the most important dates ever to me. So awesome. I was in intuiting that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, okay, fine. You can have another chance in June. So then like... <laughs> 
was she was like, you have to wait another month (laughs) because you wasted my 10 minutes. (laughs) That's awesome. So June, June 1st, I was like, it's June. So then we, every June 1st, she always, when she wakes up, it's always like, it's June. (laughs) (laughs) So she gave me another chance. She said, okay, tell me when you get there. And if you're there on time, I'll let you know if I'm going to come or not. Oh, okay. I like this. I liked how she had standards. It was very comfortable communicating her boundaries. So this time, and I was so sick. When the day of our date arrived, I was so sick. But I knew if I, if I told her out, can we reschedule? I'd never get another chance. Yeah. So, so instead, I got there two and a half hours early. I brought a book. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Hi. Keep going. <laughs> I'm listening. <laughs> and... um. And she was like, okay, I'll show up. And she showed up and the rest was history. history. And these videos live forever. So 10 years later, when y'all are in high school. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're going to be able to pull this up and show it to people. Okay. 10 more minutes, I promise. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Okay, well, maybe tomorrow we can cover the driveway. Yeah. Okay, close the door. Do you guys plan on having children? Adora is 25 weeks pregnant. <gasps> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that is so exciting. Isn't that awesome? Yes. <laughs> I get to release that, right? Like, I get to put that into my podcast episode. Yep. She so gave me good. permission oh at 23 God. weeks. That is so cool. Congratulations. Thank you. That's exciting. I'm really excited for you guys that I, oh my gosh, my husband and I, we, we're past that phase, obviously, but, um, it was fun. We had a good time. Like he, he likes pregnant Antoinette. Okay. So one question that I want to ask you before we wrap up is when I sat with you before you asked me what my definition of grace was Mm. and I kind of scrambled to say something. And so, um, I'd like to hear more about what your definition of grace is. Mm. It's, it's funny you say that because, you know, we're recording this right now in December. And so mm-hmm. once we finish recording, uh, I always try to record too. Once I put on all the makeup and everything and shave that, let me record another episode while I'm here. So I'm going to record my final year of grace episode where I'm going to talk about my reflections upon what is grace. So two, two big things for me. So in my personal life, when I'm in those moments where I'm efforting and I'm equating you like, as Brene Brown says, like I'm hustling for my worthiness. And the equation is that like work and efforting, even when it's painful is what's going to equal success. And that is what's going to equal happiness. Mm -hmm. So when I'm in that loop and I pause and I step back and I say, and I really ask myself, what do I really want right now? And if it's genuine, I want to go lay down or I want to go do a spin class or Mm -hmm. whatever is that thing that's going to bring me joy. When I do that thing instead of the efforting thing, and then all of a sudden like that in an instant, that thing that I've been trying so hard to make happen when I finally let go and in an instant it comes to me, that phenomenon I call grace. Okay. That's, I like that because I actually just recently had a situation with that where there was something that I was just really, really gunning for. And I was just, Mm. you know, like pushing, like strong arming for it. And then I let go. I was like, you know what? It's just whatever. It'll happen when it happens. And I turned my back for a split second and then bam, it came together just like that. And I was so surprised and blown away. But I was also kind of like, okay, why didn't I see that coming? Of course it's going to happen that way. I have babies on the floor of my office. (laughs) That should be on a shirt. (laughs) All right. I know. You're so smart, Tom. Watch. Watch me put it on a shirt. Okay. Let's see your drawing. I like it. Yes. We have very similar colors. 
Yeah, we do. That's amazing. I used all my favorite colors on this, so I'm happy with it. <laughs> That's awesome. Let's, let's right. hold it up for two seconds and we'll take a screenshot and, and post edit. Okay. Tom, thank you so much for agreeing to color with me. I had a good time talking with you. And I did not. It was terrible. <laughs> okay, you know what? I, I tried something new and look at what it got me. <laughs> so I did too. It was super amazing. I love, you were totally right that you get very laid back. There's things, you know, that I, that I shared and got a chance to talk about in here that I haven't before. And, you know, for, for three years, I ran a, a nonprofit where I, I did creative arts with kids to process their emotions. And so I haven't really got a chance to do this in a while. So I appreciate getting a chance to get back into the coloring game. So it's an awesome. honor. Thank you so much as, as well. Yes, definitely. So um, be sure to check out the podcast for more coloring episodes because I'm planning to upload some more because this is very relaxing. I feel, I feel good after doing all of this and having a chance to talk. For folks who are listening to Antoinette's podcast, if you want to connect, you can get in touch with me at Tom Earl, E-A-R-L artist, at Tom Earl artist, or Tom Earl.com, E-A-R-L. And what's your social for folks listening to the replay on my episode? Yes. And so if you're looking for me, you can find me at The Midday Reset on Instagram. Also, same thing for Facebook, at The Midday Reset. And we have a brand new shiny website that you can check out at MiddayReset.com. Boom.